All right. Um, last time we were going over some of the things that were cited as being confusing, and so I'd like to wrap that up today. And uh, I'm going to put up on the board the image that uh, I took of the, the whiteboard and which ones we um, have covered, which ones we haven't covered. Um, and we'll polish that up, and then we'll talk about refactoring the code for um, the truck example. We did talk about the different validation controls. We spent a substantial amount of time talking about that and also about the initial value of the dropdown. I did talk a bit about renaming the application. That is straightforward. What seems to be less straightforward, uh, because the name of the file gets put in several places, is renaming an individual page. So typically what I do, rather than hassling with that, is I will just start with a new page and copy and paste code. All right, that's my suggestion. If you are going to rename it, though, know that you need to rename it in several places. And you can scan the code to find where you need to rename it. And you also need to rename the code behind file and scan within that to find where to rename it. All right. Linking to ASP.NET controls in code. Um, someone cited that. It looks like we have so like four things. So linking ASP.NET controls into code. A couple of things related to using CSS versus the layout and whatever. And we kind of alluded to that, but we can talk about that along with this. So CSS, because that is a challenge. Linking ASP.NET controls into code and turning logic into code. All right. Um, let's start by making a quick website, and we'll try to... We'll try to cover all of these in this one example. This is going to be a real straightforward example. Um, I'm going to enter in a person's pay rate. I'm going to enter in the number of hours they worked. And if they um, work more than 40 hours, then they get paid overtime. So they get paid time and a half. Real simple logic, but we can use that as a point of discussion for how to do more involved logic. So I'm going to go say new website. Make an empty website and we'll put it on the desktop. the new page. So I'm not going to put any validation on the page. And remember, I, I, I had to say this in a couple of many cases when I graded um, your lab two, I think. And that is to use the ASP.NET controls. You know, take full advantage of them. A lot of people wrote their own validation. And it's not a matter, uh, again, we, we talked about that in class, it's not a matter of whether you can or can't do it, it's a matter of what's the best to use. These have been thoroughly tested. Um, it allows for a level of consistency within your application. It has the advantage of firing off both client and server side. All right, so there's a lot of reasons why you want to 
use the build-in controls. You know, you want to swim with the current uh, instead of trying to do everything yourself. All right? So I'm going to go, and I'm just going to put, uh, I'm not going to make this pretty at all. Uh, I'll do a little bit with styling, but I'll put a label for Put a couple lay a uh, couple labels, a couple text boxes, a button, and then another label to put the result. So label, 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 button. Text box, text box, and I probably want to rearrange the button a little bit. Now, one of the questions that was answered that we talked about last time is the dragging and the visual view versus the um, code view. I like to do things in both views. There are some things that are just easier for me to do in one, easier to do in the other. Um, do be aware, though, that when you use the code view, that it is not, it is a program that is writing the HTML for you. It's not an expert HTML coder. So, therefore, it does things in a very brute force way. If you remember last time, if I recall correctly, you put break tags in, for example. And we know that putting break tags in your code is not a good practice. So, therefore, you sort of have to be on the lookout for that. And if it's bothersome the way it does it, then don't use it for those reasons. Usually what I like to do is a quick way to just click on this and get the property window for it. Uh, I'm going to go to code view because I want my button to be actually after this text box. I mean, everything you do in one, you can do in the other. It really doesn't matter. It's just that when you use the um, graphical view, and especially with positioning, uh, my suggestion for all this is to do as little positioning as, as, as necessary using the um, graphical view and the ASP.NET properties and rely on CSS code. All right, so I'm going to go, I'm going to call this txt hours txt rate lbl results now we went over validation control last time so I'm not going to go over it again this time um, but let's just talk about the validation controls that we would put on here what would we put um, what kind of validation controls do you think we would put um, on this? Required fields. Required fields, definitely. And it, uh, probably a range, right? Because you can only work a certain number of hours in a week. You can't say I work 200 hours in a week because there's only 168 hours in the week. So you know that that can't be a valid value. So you could put a range validator on that. You might be able to put a range validator on the wage rate, for example. Um, uh, depending on the job, it's probably not less than whatever the minimum wage is, right? Although I know there's exceptions for certain kinds of businesses. And there's probably also a top rate that hourly employees are going to be paid. So you could put that on there. Now, if you put a range validator on, it does the type checking for free. So that's sort of the good news. So you don't have to put the type checking on there as well. If you didn't put a range validator on, um, you could do a type check, and you would do that by using a compare. But I would say for each of these, probably the best approach to take would be to have required field validators and then a range validator. All right. So I'm going to go to the graphical view, and I'm going to double click on the button. Now notice what happens when I double click on the button. I get put into code for a button click event. But that's not the only thing that changed. All right? 
If I go back and look at the button, it is associated an on-click event with the button. That's really what ties that button to that event. I think we uh, or to that method. I think we talked about that be before, but it bears repeating. Um, once or twice a semester, either me or a student will somehow do something wrong, and maybe they'll go and delete that or whatever. And um, you have code that's there but never runs. All right. How can you tell if code runs? Well, there's one way is if you get the results that you want, the code probably ran. What's another way that you can tell what code runs? Use a debugger to put a breakpoint in and, and trace it and all that. All right. So, so far this is just sort of setting up because the three things that I want to address is I want to address the use of CSS. I want to address um, the use of... Um, how to turn the logic into um, um, code. I then want to um, address um, how, to, how to access um, the controls. All right. So, first thing to remember is you really need to know how to do this yourself before you try to write the code to do it. All right. You got to know how to do it yourself. In other words, you need to be able to manually do the calculation. All right? Because if you don't know that, it's hopeless trying to write code to do the calculation. So you need to know how this works. And I definitely support, and a lot of programmers resist this, but I definitely support some form of planning. Now, how can you plan your code? And this is a very simple example, so it doesn't require tons of planning. But you can plan your code several different ways. Uh, one way is writing pseudocode, pseudocode, where you actually write out sort of in not complete programming logic um, the process that you're going through. Another is through a flowchart. And a flowchart really only has a couple of symbols in it. You can get by writing decent flowcharts with um, a start and stop symbol, a rectangle to indicate an operation, and a diamond to represent a decision. Even loops can be represented with those things. All right. The other thing that you can do, which is a good practice and is pretty clever, one of my old colleagues suggested it, is to write the comments first. All right. Now, there's a couple of reasons for writing the comments first. One is, if you save the comments to last, you're liable to never go back and fill in the comments to comment the code to tell you how to do it. That's just human nature. You're done. You got the results that you want. Well, I'm going to go back and document it. You don't know how many times I've heard in my career, how many times I have said in my career that, well, I'm finished. I will go back and document it later. All right. There are COBOL programs that I wrote in the 80s that I have not gotten around to going back and documenting later. All right. Um, going back and documenting later rarely, rarely, rarely happens because your boss is probably going to want you to move on to the next task. So what do you do? You document before you do it because your documentation is sort of a plan. So, first of all, again, this is turning logic into code. First of all, is to be real sure that you know the logic. You know, more than just saying, well, yeah, I know how you do the calculation. Yeah, you, you check for overtime and blah, blah, blah. The way that you prove to yourself that you really know how to do this is to document it. Because you may vaguely think that you know how to do it, but when you actually get down to documenting it and writing the steps, then that is um, a better way to plan. So, how do we calculate someone's gross pay? Pardon me? Hours times rate. Hours times rate. Well, what if they're overtime?
let's take it one step at a time. Get hours from tax box. Get rate from tax box. See if person gets overtime. Whether it's going to eventually be an if statement. Get over time, how do you calculate their gross pay? That seems to be really gross equal. If they don't get over time, their gross is simply wage times rate or um, rate times hours. Repeat that, please. Um, just do all the hours, multiply them by one, and then um, if it's hours multiplied by the wage. Oh, by the rate. Okay. Yeah. And if it's over forty, then multiply it by point five and add that to. Um, multiply what by point five? Half of the half half the wage, and then times the hours over forty. The, okay. All right, I think what you said is correct. Let's go through that one step at a time. So think about what when you get paid overtime. You get paid time and a half, right? So if you get paid $10 an hour, let's, get, let's make the math easy. All right, if you get paid $10 an hour and you work 50 hours, all right, you get, and you could do this a couple of different ways, right? Uh, and it'll all end up to be the same thing. But if you work uh, 50 hours and get $10 an hour, you get your regular rate for those 10 or for those 50 hours. So part of your gross pay is going to be um, your, your rate times the number of hours. So that would be 10 times 50. That would be $500. But you also get for every hour over 40, you get an extra half of your rate. So you would get added uh, um, hours minus 40. So in our case, that would be 10 times one half of the rate. So your gross pay has two components. So if they get overtime, calculate regular wage for hours. Add to it one half times rate, I'll make that 0.5 rate, times hours over 40. And how do we determine the hours over 40? Subtract what from what? Hours minus, hours minus 40. All right. So that's sort of the formula, all right? So let's go in, and now we have this.
this kind of leads us in the direction of writing the code. We have the logic figured out and we have the logic documented and we've thought this through and if we are smart, we will have tested this out. So someone that gets $10 an hour, if they worked 50 hours, they should get how much? What should their, what should their gross pay be? How much? Okay, so let's figure that out. Let's see, that would be 50 times 10. That would be 500. Half of 10 is 5 times 50 minus 40 is 10. So 5 times 10 is 50. 500 plus 50 is 550. So you're right. So we've gone and we've tested it before we've written a line of code. So our logic is right. We just now need to know the statements. We're going to translate our logic and we're going to do it a bit at a time. All right. That's the other thing. Now, now payroll calculations uh, can be very complicated, especially when you get into withholding tax and, and things like that. So if I were doing this for real, maybe my first pass would be to do the wage calculation not considering any overtime. Just do wage times rate and, and display that. And then go in and add the logic for overtime. So my twofold strategy for turning your logic into code is number one, First, make sure you really understand the logic, all right? And you don't just sort of vaguely in your head. And how do you show that you really understand the logic? By being able to document it, either being able to write out a description of each step or write the comments for your code. And might as well, you should be putting them in anyhow, right? Or, in some cases, writing a flow chart. Any of those are, are good. What I like about this is this serves another purpose, and that is documenting it for future people. Okay. So, get hours from text box. Double hours equals what? Now, here's where the question that we had before, how do we link our .NET controls to our c -sharp code? The hook is the ID. All right. So, in this case, the text box that has the hours is called TXT hours. So, that is your hook into this, the ID. All right? So, TXT hours, but we want something specific about the hours. We want the text. So, we have to say what property. Now, we're going to get an error with this. Why do we get an error with this? Right, because a text box literally could contain any string. And we, we, want to, um, we want to treat it as a number. Now, we talked before about validation, so we're, we're going to skip that today, but we would put val validation in here. How do we change that? text, how do we tell the, the, the server to treat that text as a double? Pardon me? Pardon me? You need to speak up. So what would... And you know what? You have to do this even if you are doing validation, right? Because you have to convert that to a double. Okay. All right. We're going to do the same thing for the rate. Now, what's the statement to see if a person gets overtime? If hours.
powers are greater than 40, then they do this. What if we add an extra condition on here? How do you combine conditions? Um, else if really gives you a sort of a, a series of conditions, all right? Um, what I meant is like, what if there was a checkbox that said whether the person was hourly or, or salaried? Then you could either combine it with an and, which would look like this, or an or that looks like this. All right. So if they get overtime, we're going to calculate their oops, regular wage times hours. So I could say I'm going to make a double gross equals zero. And I could say gross equals hours times rate. All right. Okay, so I could. Have I have plus. And then I'm going to add to it 0.5 times the rate times the hours over 40. What would that expression look like? Gross equals gross plus hours 0.5 times hours minus 40 times the rate. Are the parentheses needed there? Yes. yes. Again, because the order of operations is to do multiplication first. If I did not do the, oper uh, the, the parentheses there, it would take 0.5 times hours, 40 times rate, and then subtract those two numbers together. And I don't know what you'd end up with, but it definitely wouldn't be right. And finally, gross equals finally display it in on the screen, label results, e, uh, dot text equals gross to string. Now, so to answer the question of, to go back and review, to answer the question of um, how to turn logic into code, one is to, to make sure you really understand the logic first. Document it some way. My suggestion would be via putting the comments in. And then last, where appropriate, do a little piece at a time. This is small enough that I could pretty much do the whole thing all in one shot. But if it was like a larger one, like the tuition calculation for LC students that I often assign or whatever, you might want to break it down and do a bit of it at a time. All right? Um, how do you refer to elements? Well, the ID is your hook. That's what you're going to use to refer to the controls on your ASP.NET page. But the other thing that you need to know is you need to know the specific attributes that you want to use. So it's not enough to say label results. We want to set the text attribute because that label has a bunch of properties. The background color, the position on the screen, and so on and so forth. So we have to refer to the specific thing that we want to change. Run this and make sure it works.
10, 550. How many things would you test this for? How many test cases would you have here to test to make sure this works? At least under and over, so something in the lower than 40 hours, something above 40 hours. Might I suggest that you do right on the border as well? All right, so maybe do 40 and maybe do 40.1 or 41, depending on whether it's an hour or, or whether the hours are integers or whatever. So I would probably do something in the one range, something in the other range, um, something right at the border and something right on the other side of the border, just to make sure, all right? Because it's always easy to screw up and put in a greater than when you meant to say greater than or equal to, or something along those lines. In this case, I don't think it matters, because you're gonna subtract 40 from the number of hours, so if you work 40 hours, you have zero hours over 40, so it's gonna end up being the same thing anyhow. But in other sorts of calculations, it might be important, all right? Uh, it's important to thoroughly test, and again, it's important to, to know what's in your code so that you know what your test cases ought to be, all right? Testing is something that's woefully neglected by beginning programmers to be sure, but even more experienced programmers as well, to test to make sure that it doesn't just work for one case, but it works for multiple cases. Any questions about this? All right, linking the CSS to, that's, that's sort of the last thing that we have on here, linking the CSS to um, your .NET controls. Uh, my suggestion would be to use a .NET, uh, not use any of the, the automatic CSS that's generated when you manipulate it in the visual view or use any of the properties associated with the ASP.NET controls for positioning, because you can use those. But my suggestion would be to write CSS code. That certainly seems the most flexible way and a way that lends itself to um, device independence so that you can write things that work well on mobile as well as work on a desktop. Let's remember a little bit about CSS before we begin. All right, I'm going to go and create a, a CSS file. I'm not going to put anything in it to start. And we're going to link it to this page here. Now, the basics of CSS is this, all right? You can write CSS rules for, well, let, let, me, let me rephrase this because there are more options in this, but the, 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 most, the simplest way, I don't like saying that either, all right? Let me put it this way. Three of the things that you can write CSS rules for are HTML tags, all right, are IDs, and are CSS classes. So our key in understanding CSS is understanding how we can hook into these things, all right, and the key to do that is to know what HTML gets generated. So let me go and run this. And let me do the calculation. Let's say I want these labels to look a certain way. 
and I want the result to look different. All right? And then maybe I want the text boxes to look a certain way. All right? Let's look at the HTML that gets generated. Go and do view source. I can't really make it bigger. The labels are done as spans. All right. Now we could go and we could actually create label tags for that, but HTML. But we're not going to do that right now. But we could go in and put the uh, HTML label tag around that. But we notice that those are all spans. Now I stated these two. I want to look one way. This one I want to look another way. Well, this has an ID, so I can use a CSS rule based on an ID for it. These two I can assign a class to make them look a certain way. And then finally, my text boxes are simply input tags. So let's go and do that in our CSS rule. So, I'm going to define a rule for LBL result to make it font size 2M. And sure enough, we can even see in the preview that it's that. Let's say I want to make these have a color of blue, these two. Well, I want to assign it a class. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to assign CSS class for this. And I'll give it a class of TXD label, let's say. So I can use in the ASP.NET control to assign a class to it, and then I can go in and say everything that has a class of txt label make the color blue. Finally, if I want the labels to be, or I want the input boxes to be a certain size, I can use the HTML tag for that. So now when I run this, the input controls have a color of red. These labels have a color of blue. So I type it in, and then that has a bigger size. All right. The key to knowing this is remembering the rules of CSS and how CSS works. It works on, for the most part, you can do most of your CSS by putting rules for labels, or, or I'm sorry, IDs, classes, and HTML tags. Now, actually, if you really remember uh, HTML, uh, we would we would want to actually wrap label tags. HTML label tags around these guys. I don't know why labels don't translate to HTML label tags. They really should. But um, we could do that for the accessibility so that we could tie the label to the particular text box so that someone that was seeing impaired would know what to do. All right, any questions about this? Remembering those two things is key. Remembering how you can create CSS rules for IDs, classes, and HTML tags, then knowing what HTML gets generated and knowing how to associate a CSS class with an ASP.NET control. All those things will be key in using styling. That's my philosophy. You're bound to find other people that have a different approach to it. 
right. I prefer to do all the styling using CSS. That's that's the language that that ought to be done in, and doing that will will render you the most flexibility. Any idea how we could refactor this? Refactoring has sort of been my theme. All right. Now to be sure, we could create a class and all that, but I actually could just do something like this, and I could simplify this code, even without making a custom class or creating a separate function. I could just do this, because notice we do this part of the calculation no matter what. So I could actually take this, put it here, And then, if they get overtime, just add the extra overtime in it. A little more concise code, and I've eliminated a little bit of duplication. All right. Now, eliminating duplication is good because, now again, the calculation for gross pay is pretty much always going to be your wage rate times that, at least uh, the times the hours. But if it was something that was vulnerable to change, if it was something that could change, then you would have to change it in two places if it were to change. Now, could you have seen that before you planned it out and wrote it? Man, yeah, maybe. Maybe a, an experienced programmer would have known that and wrote this code like this originally. But once you write your code, take a look at it and see if there's a way to remove any duplicated items. It's, it's no different than when you write a paper. After you finish writing a paper, you shouldn't just turn it in. You should take a minute to proofread it and see, well, are there some things that I could be more clear about? Are there things that um, don't make any sense to me? Uh, am I saying things in a roundabout way where I could say it more concisely? All right. Refactoring is no different than that. Now, once we do this, we ought to test it again, but I'm pretty sure that it will work. Um, and we should test all our test cases. So 50 and 10, 550. I'm going to pretend I did the other tests and, and do this. A lot of times it's good to have a test plan. Like what are you going to test? Because then if you make a change, even a change that seems unrelated, you can do what's called regression testing. In other words, see if the change that you made maybe fixed one thing but broke something else. All right? And again, the better style of coding you have, the less likely you will do that, but that's always going to be a risk. All right, questions about this? All right. I will try to remember to do this a few times during the semester because I think it's beneficial to stop before we go any further and do this. The next thing I want to do, though, is I want to look at refactoring our truck example. Now, the only prerequisite for this class, coding-wise, if I remember correctly, is the intro to C sharp. So some of you may have had or are taking advanced C sharp. If that's the case, you might do what I'm about to do a little bit differently. All right? But just keep in mind that my intent here is to show the benefit of separating the code out into its own class. My goal is not to write the perfect class, all right, to write a great class. My goal is just simply to show the advantage of separating the code out into separate classes, all right? So keep that in mind. So if you look at this and say, well, I would have, I would make these properties and I would have get and set methods and blah, 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 yeah, you're probably right. But Again, if you have not done that, that's an awful lot to, to cover um, at this time in this class. 
So I just want to point out the, the benefit, and as you learn more about creating classes and using objects, you will be able to do a better job than this, but at least this is a starting point. So let's open up this guy. And if you remember right, when we run this, we can enter some parameters in. Start date and ending date, and there's validation here, so 9... 20, 2016. I don't remember all the validation in here. And it calculates the bill. Alright. Now we talked about the problem with doing this. And in a nutshell, the problem uh, with doing this is that this code, the code that does the calculation, lives as part of the button. Alright? It lives as part of the button. And what is wrong with that? Well, we might want to do this code in other places. I mentioned um, that we might have, for example, a page where the uh, customer can estimate how much their bill is going to be by saying, well, I plan on renting this truck on this day and bringing it back on this day. I plan on driving so many number of miles and, and so on. All right. So there may be code when you go to make the reservation to tell you how much you can expect to pay for it. But, again, if you drove twice as many miles in it, you know, you're going to do that, cal they're going to do that calculation again when you check the truck in to give you your actual bill. So it's like an estimate and your actual bill. So this calculation might exist in two places. It might exist on the page where the customer makes their reservation, and it might exist on a private page, uh, a secured page, that only employees of the rental truck company go to when you actually check in your truck. And they, they print your bill and all that. So the fact that this code lives associated with this button is not a good thing. Because if we were to create another page that needed to do the same calculation, we would have to duplicate that page. Duplicate code should set your alarms off. All right, Because that's two places that you need to make a change if anything changes. If the code just lives in one place, there's only one place you need to change. So, what we want to do is we want to separate this code out. And to make it as flexible as possible, we want our code to have nothing to do with the user interface. Alright? In other words, on this page, I have text boxes. Is that the only way to enter a date? No, you could enter date with a um, calendar control or other means. Is the size of the truck, is that the only way we could do it with radio buttons? No, we could have drop downs, all right, and so on. So to make this as flexible as possible, we want to separate that user interface out, and we want our calculation to not care where the data came from, but if you supply it the data, it'll give you the answer. All right? So, what do we need to do our calculation here? All right? Um, I'll give you another example, by the way. On the place where I estimate how much my bill is going to be, I may just estimate my number of miles. In the case where they're checking it in and checking it out, 
they may actually put in the odometer reading to say that you started with 12,000 miles and you ended up with 12,200 miles and the calculation is done. So the data may be entered a whole bunch of different ways, yet we still want to use the same calculation. The bottom line is, in order to do the calculation, we need to know the starting date the ending date, the miles, and the size of truck. Alright, that's what we need to know in order to do the calculation. So that's what we should give our function. Our function shouldn't care about where those came from. Our function shouldn't care if we use a calendar controller or a text box or we have to enter in a starting and ending odometer or whatever, a drop down or radio buttons. We need to simply supply these values to our function. And what's our function going to return? It's going to return the total amount. So, what kind of data is the starting date? Well, it's a date time. What kind of ending, uh, what kind of data is the ending date? It is a date time. Miles is a double. Size of truck is a string. And the total that we're going to return is going to be a double. So, what we're doing here is we're defining what's called the signature of the function. The signature of the function is the name of the function, along with the arguments that it needs to do its job, along with the result it's going to return. All right? And again, to write good functions, we want this to not be associated with text boxes and radio buttons or drop downs or whatever. We want to we just want to be interested in the values of things. So my function is going to accept four arguments. It's going to accept a date time, another date time, a double for the number of miles, a string for the size, and it's going to return a double. Now, ideally, we want this code to live not associated with our page because we've already determined that we might want to call this code from multiple pages. So we're going to put it in a custom class. We're going to put it in a class we create. Remember, we're essentially adding our own component to our framework. The ASP.NET framework is a generalized component. It's, it contains stuff that everyone that does websites is going to want to use. This is something that's distinct to our particular organization and our particular organization's needs. So we're creating a component that we can use anywhere in our application to do a particular job. Now, we actually could put a whole bunch of stuff in this component. This, for example, might be the truck component that calculates uh, the amount of the rental fee. We could have stuff in our truck component that deals with the financing of the truck, the purchasing of the truck the maintenance of the truck, and so on. Keeping track of when it last had oil changes and does it need an oil change or whatever. All right, But we're just going to put this stuff in there now because that's all we're interested in for this particular example. All right, so let's go and we'll be able to do some cut and paste it here because I have a code that works. I'm simply rearranging it to put it in a better place. All right, can I have the lights? So I'm going to go to File, New, File, 
and I'm going to pick a class. By all means, please give it a meaningful name. Notice it says class one. It's going to put me in a bad mood if I see class one in any of your exam uh, uh, assignments. This should represent what our class represents. So we're, dealing, we're talking about trucks here, right? So I'm going to call this truck. I'm going to click add. This gives me a warning. This is telling me that, generally speaking, you want to put your classes in an app code folder. So I'm going to take that suggestion and say yes. When we do this, we get an empty class file. Now, again, when you learn more about creating classes in advanced C Sharp and learn about attributes and constructors and get and set methods and properties and all that kind of stuff, you could do a better job with this. But for now, I'm going to create my one function in here to do the calculation. And my function is going to be public, which means I want other classes to be able to call it. It's going to return a double. Calculate rental fee, let's say. And then I specify my arguments. And if you remember, we had a starting and ending date. Argument for miles and an argument for what? Oh, the size of the truck. So now, we have the shell of our function. We should be able to copy and paste from this code. So I'm going to copy.
instead of parsing that text box, my miles is hard miles. Hard mics. And instead of looking at a radio button, I am simply looking at the value of the size argument. Change this from rate to fee, or from cost to fee, because that's the terminology I was using. And then I return the value. Notice how, again, we refactored. We're keeping essentially the same code. We're just putting it in another place, and we're making it so it doesn't have anything to do with the particular user interface. Those are two important concepts here, because both those things are what makes this a winner. All right. Now we can use this code in more than one place. Instead of being associated with the button, it's in its own class. All right. In addition to that, it doesn't matter where we get the data from. All right. As long as we have a, a page that can supply those fields, it doesn't matter where we get the data from. This doesn't care where we entered that date in as long as we have a date. Actually, two dates, number of miles, and size of truck. All right. Now, we have to change this guy. I have to make one of these truck objects. Because remember, when we define a class, we're just sort of creating a template for it. And I have to call that function. Calculate rental fee. And we have to give it the values that it expects. It expects a start date. Well, where do we get the start date? We get the start date from parsing that text box. Where do we get the end date? We get the end date from parsing the other text box. We need the number of miles, which we get from parsing that. text box. And finally, where do we get the size of the truck? We get it from the selected value of our radio button. So look how slim our calculation has become. Because that calculation actually lives somewhere else. The only thing this event's job is, the only, the only job this event has is to gather the input. All right? to link, to glue together the UI that we've choosen, chosen to make with the actual guts, the actual code itself. And so if I wanted to redo this on a different page that had different controls, that used calendar controls and used um, drop downs instead of radio buttons and used a slider instead of a text box for date, all right, 
All I would have to do is change where it's getting the values for the function from. So on this form, this is the right place to get those values. It's going to take that, plug it into these arguments, do the calculation, the calculation gets returned, and then we display it in the label. So the thing that calls the business rules, all it needs to do is gather the information, call the function, and then display the results somewhere. It doesn't do any parts of the calculation itself. So let's imagine I had this code in five different places, five different UIs that all call that calculate function. If I change the rules about how much it costs to rent a truck, if I double the mileage, or if I um, change the amount for a large truck or whatever, I would only need to change that in one place here. And all the other places that called it simply just still continue to give it the same values and get the result, which would be now calculated a different way. So let's run this. Let's make sure that it works. I'm going to assume that's correct, we should go and check it. And again, we should check all the conditions, right? Because we've made a change to this. It's possible that in moving the code around, even though I think I took great care in doing so, that I broke it for certain conditions. So we would want to go and check that and make sure that it works. And again, that's where having a suite of test cases is beneficial because I could go in and retest this and make sure that I get the same results that I got before. Make sure that those results are correct. All right, so this objectively is a better solution than the solution I had going into it. Why? Because it's reusable. Any place that needs to do this calculation now, I can do it even if the user interface looks different and I'm not going to be copying or cutting and pasting code or whatever. All right. We might talk a little bit more about this next time, just to see if you have any questions or to review it or whatever. Um, and then we're going to get into um, reusability for UI stuff, things like master pages and navigation controls and things like that. All right, we'll see you over in lab. He comes back from time to time. He's been around. He's been back for a while, um, and he is he is amazing. Yeah, he is. <laughs> no, he he's really messed up. If I remember right, knees or hips. He had a stroke, I think.